everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter. And I just want to thank you all for your tremendous support here for this podcast, both in the audio format and on YouTube. If you're looking for an easy way to support this podcast, please consider joining the Kung Fu Genius Patreon. You can support for as little as $5 a month and get access to episodes a few days early. Higher levels of support will even get additional goodies, exclusive content, and even your name in the description. The baller level of support will give you the opportunity to be Dre for a day and give me a rest from this guy here. A link for the Kung Fu Genies Patreon page is in the description below. You can also support us by subscribing to the Kung Fu Genies on YouTube, liking this video, and sharing it on your social media platforms. And with that, let's get started. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of yip man driving around in cars, and lots of the Kung Fu craze wasn't started by Bruce Lee or David Carradine. Let's get to it. <laughs> He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> Word is, I'm a Kung Fu genius. Practice all day like a genius. Practice all day like a genius. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? Yo, what's up, Sifu? What's good? What's, what's good? What's up with you, man? What's, what's, you're, you're looking like no, budget ass no. pitbull over there. What's going on? What do you mean? I just what's it's up with mad, the glasses? Yeah, it's, just, it's mad bright in here for some reason. Ah, it's I mad see, early. See. Got it's it. Like, got it's it. Nine a.m. Yeah, Mr. County wide. Mr. County wide yeah. over there. <laughs> the budget version of pitbull. He's not not worldwide. He's county wide. <laughs> 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 Richmond County. Yeah, yeah. No, what's no, up? What are you talking about? It, it was good. It was good with the uh, get up. What do you mean the get up? It's, it's, uh, I got I to gotta work after this today. I got to go to work after this. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't know what you mean. You, yeah, you're after bouncing? The, after, you're bouncing too? No, after what, the podcast, you, I got. I, I teach martial arts. That's what I do for a living. I got to work you, after you, that. You, you're working in the suit. You're teaching in the suit. Yeah, no, I mean, I just, you know, like you, yeah. you often have to work after the podcast, so you come dressed up, trying to make me look like a straight ass, and uh, so, but I realized, hey, today I also have to work after the podcast, so I uh, so I came dressed as well. Wore... The difference is, is that you come dressed up, he just threw that together. Mm. That's right. Mm. You have a stylist, you mm. plan this out. This is just, I found this at the oh. bottom of my closet. Oh, Bottom okay. of the KFG that's closet. That's why it looks so neat and, and, and polished. Yeah, because I never wear it. That's yeah. why. Okay. <laughs> so sure. we got a, we got another AMA today. Yes, we do. So let's get cracking, man. Let's get this party started. All right. So first up, let's get right into it. We got Ving Chun Fist. Well, Wing Chun Fist. Okay. Okay. Please tell us a bit about that British chap. And a bit more about Dre. Are they students and instructors, employees? Oh, who is this? Oh, I like this person. I like this guy. Yeah. yeah. Hey, how you doing? What is how no, you no, doing? No. Shout out to Ving Chun Fist. Yeah, Ving Chun Fist gets a because he's okay from me. That's I right. don't know. This guy sounds like he's from the IRS <laughs> and he wants to know if you guys are independent <laughs> yeah. contractors oh, or right. act, actual <laughs> employees of City Wing Chun Incorporated, right? He uh, was from the IRS, totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is like they're fighting out. So wait, are these guys on a 1099 or are they, <laughs> who are these guys? Very clever, Wing wow. Chun Fist. Very clever. Wow. Under but the I, advice of my lawyer, I cannot say anymore. But I see through your ruse, mm. and I ain't answering that. <laughs> these guys are these guys are out for us, Mikey Dean. These yeah. guys are just dudes who walk on by. Yeah. And come in here, we talk a little bit, and then they leave and I never see them again. Mm. The British guy, as a matter of fact, I don't even know where he's from. We Dre and I started doing this podcast, <laughs> and that guy just started in. showing up, and we haven't been able to get rid of him, and that's uh, pretty much it. So, I'm uh, actually from Great Britain. That's a clue in the British guy thing. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, he's a victim of Brexit. So mm. um, let's, uh, <laughs> let's go to the next one. All right, JKD Merit Master Group. That's quite the handle. Curious, how much Mantis Kung Fu have you looked into? And if so, did you see the similarities between Wing Chun and, let's say, Mantis or Dragon? 
Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so um, one thing I have to make clear, because not everyone in our audience is going to know like the differences there, there are two main streams of what is known as mantis kung fu. So you actually just cannot say praying mantis or mantis, because there is a northern mantis mm -hmm. and a southern mantis that have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And so, so if you just say mantis kung fu, we go uh, northern or southern, all right? Mm. Because the um, one of the most famous streams of northern mantis, the seven star mantis, is the one that you you know you've seen with the with the hooks, right? Where they have the kind of mantis looking hook hands, right? You see wow. that in films, and obviously in the the practitioners who who do that martial art. That's the northern mantis style. Southern mantis style doesn't use that kind of hooked hand mantis thing. Um, Southern mantis is actually much more closely related to uh, Fujian or Fujian white crane. Uh, these are Southern martial arts that were developed and brought over by these Hakka tribes who came from the north, and they brought these into also into Guangdong. So the the Hakka tribes are basically they're these nomadic northern tribes that had their own martial arts, and they came to Fujian and mix their martial arts with Fujianese martial arts, White Crane, and brought those over to Canton. So they're actually the ones responsible because people always go like, well, how did Fujianese martial arts? So, so Fujian is the next province next to Guangdong, Canton. So the question is always, well, how did these martial arts from Fujian get to Guangdong? And most likely the connection was through the Hakka people. Hmm. And so they took these styles and they mixed it with their own indigenous martial arts styles. And then essentially Hakka martial arts are really the seeds of a lot of orthodox southern martial arts in China. So even Wing Chun has some Hakka roots. Southern Mantis is a Hakka style. White Eyebrow is a Hakka style. And there, I believe there's even a southern dragon style, which is which mm. is Hakka oriented, right? So, um, so yeah, so yeah, you have to be careful when you just say mantis because it's like well which mantis are we talking about right southern mantis because it is a haka style is uh very closely related to wing chun and uh very closely related to white crane white crane is kind of the og and a lot of the southern martial arts come from that white crane base and so you see a lot of those things and, and when we talk about white crane it's also we're not talking about the pecking crane that most people think from the Hong Kong tiger crane form or from the films, we're talking about the more open hand palm style crane. The white crane is not this pecking crane, right? And you see the, the, the white crane DNA in Wing Chun, you see the white crane DNA in, um, in Hong Kong, and you certainly see the white crane DNA in Southern Mantis because they, they have forms like the, the, the Samtin, which bear pretty much the same name uh, with one character change as the original white crane style. Mm. And that form is very similar, except they change a lot of the open palm stuff to the Phoenix Eye Fist. So I uh, became, wow. yeah, I became really interested in Southern Mantis because of like a two two major two major things that kind of piqued my interest there. Uh, one, there's a famous Wing Chun Sifu uh, named uh, Wan Kam Leung. Wan Kam Leung is a student of uh, the late great Wong Sun Leung. And uh, Wan Sifu in, uh, in the late 70s, he started to learn Southern Manta. So he had already learned from uh, um, from Wong Sun Leung for many years. He was one of his very early students. And then in the late 70s, uh, I believe he learned from Yip Soi. Yip Soi was the former, he was kind of like, imagine what Yip Man is to Wing Chun, Yip Soi was to Southern Mantis in Hong Kong. He's kind of like oh, one of the main masters at that time. And even within Mantis, you have, you always have these politics, right? So in Southern Mantis, you have um, the Chao Ka, which is the Chao family, right? And so that is one stream of it. Um, but then you also have the Jiu Ga, which is like another stream of it. And they um, are kind of from the same source, but there's a little bit of politics as to which one is the right one and so on and so Can't forth. So the I'm a Wing Chun guy. I got no skin in the game. So I'm not even going to talk about that stuff, right? Um, I'll let those guys litigate it. But anyway, uh, Yip Soi is basically the kind of the main master. And, and so from what I understood, of course, I could be wrong on this, uh, Wang Kam Leung learned from Yip Soi in the late 70s for a little bit. 
And later he went to redevelop his Wing Chun into what he calls a practical Wing Chun. And for anyone who's seen Wang Kam Leung's forms, you can see that he's basically re-engineered a lot of the Wong Sun Leung stuff to, to, to fit a slightly different idea that's based on his own experience and perhaps also based on some of his training in Southern Mantis. So um, that kind of piqued my interest because I go, well, this is a style clearly that you know, Wan Kam Leung, someone who's very famous in the Wing Chun style, you know, have, gave a lot of uh, 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 thought to because it's something that he practiced. And, you know, uh, I don't know if he admitted it openly, but, uh, you know, maybe his practical Wing Chun is somewhat influenced by that. Right. So I so I, wow. that made me want to, like, see what that was about. Cool. And then. Uh, a few years ago, I was in uh, southern Florida uh, having dim sum with uh, one of my good friends, uh, uh, Lee Siu Hong. Lee Siu Hong, uh, or Lei Siu Hong, actually, uh, is a Choi Lei Fat master. Yeah. And he teaches in uh, he teaches in Florida. Been teaching there for many years. And he's the younger brother of Lei Gun Hong. Lei Gun Hong was like the one of the most famous Choi Lei Fat masters, one mm -hmm. of the best. And Lei Gun Hong, like he also learned from Sekin Han from Enter the Dragon, yeah. but he was like a, one, like very top of the food chain Chai Lei Fat practitioner. And when I was a kid, I I bought like some of the Lei Gun Hong books. Like I remember, I bought a book where he's showing how to like do a. Um, uh, form with like a fan and stuff and okay. like so so you know as a kid you want to learn all the cool kung fu stuff right so yeah. i remember going to the kung fu store and lee kun hong had like all these awesome books on like learning a fight with fan and sword mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff right so i remember i had his books and i would see him in the inside kung fu magazines and knew that lee kun hong was very like famous very famous charlie fat guy yeah. and l eventually in the states in the early uh, in the early 90s uh, i think in 93 lee kun hong moved uh, immigrated from Hong Kong to Florida, which is kind of a bold move because he was a little older at that time. You know, mm. it's like not normal. Well, like like 60s? It, no, no, no. I think he was in his 40s already. But okay. it's, it's not really normal that like, you know, normally if you're going to like ch change countries or whatever, usually people do that a little bit younger. right? They mm -hmm. don't necessarily do that Pre when they're a little bit older and established. But uh, uh, from what I understood, I think his daughter was going to go to school in the States and he decided to come. Uh. And then so he decided to open a Choi Lei Fat school in Florida. And you have to imagine this, like, Florida is not really, like, the hotbed of Chinese martial arts, although there's some there, but not, like, you know, you think of New York Chinatown, San Francisco Chinatown, L.A. Chinatown, right? You don't think of, like, you know, South Florida, right? Yeah. And suddenly in the early to mid-90s, you have one of the most legitimate and, uh, you know, famous masters of Choi Lei Fat teaching there, right? And unfortunately, I think a year or maybe a year and a half later, Lei Kun Hong passed away suddenly. Mm. He had, uh, I believe he had a heart defect and he just passed away. And his younger brother, uh, Lei Siu Hong from Hong Kong, came and took over for took his brother. Took over to school. So, and, wow. and, and, and which is pretty amazing, right? I mean, yeah. like, you know, the school had already been started. He already had a number of students. And then the younger brother comes and starts teaching and takes over. And Lee Siu Hong doesn't really speak a lot of English. Even now he speaks some English, but like he basically just came as a Hong Kong Chinese Choi Lei Fat master and uh, just started teaching in his brother's place, right? So I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for him for doing that. And uh, so I had the I had the chance to meet Lei Siu Hong a few years ago. And like when I'm in uh, Florida, if I have time, I'll go and I'll, I'll see him, I'll visit his Shop school. It with him. And Shop what's it great up. is that, you know, he tells me, oh, when he was younger, he met Yip Man. Um, because, uh, you know, like his older brother was very famous, right? Yeah. So they would go to all these martial art banquets in Hong Kong and he was younger and he said they went to some banquet, Yip Man was there and he met Yip Man and all this stuff. So, like, so he's been around for a long time and he even gave me some, he gave me uh, like a book that was his brother's, which was like a huge honor for me, like this magazine oh, from wow. the Hong Kong Martial Art Association that he gave to me and it was like, it was a very big deal. Mm. So, um, so absolutely respect him. And he told me on one of our one of the times where we met, because Southern Mantis is a hard style of kung fu. You know, nowadays people always talk about internal and all this kind of stuff, and and people you know pretend like oh external styles are not as sophisticated or whatever. But uh, there are some real hard styles of kung fu that are very very intelligent. And in my opinion, Southern Mantis is one of the most intelligent, hard styles of Kung Fu, but it is hard. <laughs> I mean, the practice is very strenuous. And um, Lei Siu Hong told me that when he was younger, he saw a fight uh, between someone, I don't know who it was, and, uh, and someone who did Southern Mantis. And he just said the Southern Mantis guy just went, bam, and did one short movement and just blew the other guy away. And he said it was so 
mind blowing when he saw that. And he yeah. said that the the Southern Mantis they're very extreme. He said those those guys are very powerful, mm-hmm. and uh, and I just remember because it's kind of rare in Chinese martial arts that an established kung fu master will so openly praise another style. Like like it was pretty open the way he said yeah. it. And then so between like the Wan Kam Leung connection and then what Lei Xiu Hong told me, I thought maybe I should like check this out. So I um, I went to Hong Kong on one of my trips in 2015. It was the one where I went with Ethan. Yeah. And I met um, Sifu uh, Lei Tin Loi. Lei Tin Loi is one of the best, in my opinion, Zhao Ga Mantis masters in Hong Kong. He's a retired police officer. He's a no-nonsense guy. And I had to kind of like, there was some emailing back and forth because he's like, oh, you're a Wing Chun guy. Like, he's very traditional. Like, they don't really want to teach people. Like, And for me, I'm not looking to become like a Southern Mantis guy or something like that. I mean, I already have an established Wing Chun school. I want to learn. But when I learn something, I'm you want to learn I'm from really, the best. I want to learn from the best. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, like whether it's Wing Chun, you know, like have the chance to learn from uh, Sifu Leung Teng directly and learn from Sifu Kanspect and like in the WT world and Sifu Carson Lau and Elman Leung and uh, uh, Sifu Cheng Chun Fun when I was in Hong Kong and like, like learn from the best guys, right? Like, uh, which is why it's funny. Sometimes some of our European audience are like, hey, have you trained with Sifu Hans Schroeder, blah, 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 some German guy. It's like, dude. Yeah. First of all, I trained in Germany at the castle for three years <laughs> with the best guys, right? And then I went and learned from all the Hong Kong guys. You're a sea hang in the middle of Buxtehude, Germany. <laughs> I'm sure he's a big deal for you, but it's like, this is not my path, right? I'm a total snob when it comes to this stuff. Um, even when I did boxing down in Mendez Gym, like I got my boxing trainer that I trained with for six months was a Golden Gloves boxer yeah. from the Dominican Republic, right? Yeah, okay. And I trained with him. Like, just like, I just want to learn from the best dudes, right? So Li Tin Loi is like literally one of the best dudes in Southern Mantis. And I was in Hong Kong. That trip, I think, was three weeks. Uh, I went to his classes. He had the, I think his classes were twice a week. His classes were over two hours long. Very intense, old school, just like it's almost out of a Kung Fu movie. It's like mm. torturous. But I would do private lessons with him before. So I was training with Li Tin Loi three hours every night. And I did that uh, a few times a week. So I remember this. Yeah, I'm mean, Ethan was there. Trip. And like yeah. I I got I was like I was caught I had a bad cough but I kept training and Legion Lloyd was uh, you know and not to pat myself on the back but he was kind of blown away that I was like I had this nasty cough but I kept training and he kept trying to push me back and I kept pushing forward and he was like he he was impressed but I'm it's not like I'm some amazing dude I'm just extremely um bullish when I want to do something. It's like, if I want to learn this, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to, I'm going to push through and do it. And I learned the whole, the, the whole first form. Mm-hmm. And I learned their Tai Sao, their, their partner exercises. I trained with those. It was amazing. And I learned so much and it, and it redefined a lot about how I think about tendon strength training and, and explosive power and ways to train things differently. And, uh, so, you know, I'm not going to say like, I, you know, really did Southern Mantis for any period of time, but for the time that I did it, I did it with one of the best guys, and I did it with my whole heart. I lost so much weight in those weeks training with him, like I was like skin. Damn. I was like skin and bones. I looked back looking like my. Seat I came Ethan. looking like Ethan, right? But <laughs> it was crazy, like twins. Yeah, it was crazy. But I loved every minute of it, and I learned a lot. Mm. Um, it it taught me a lot about uh, about power transfer and power training. I wouldn't say it changed a lot about the the. F- fighting concept that I use, right? It made me see a couple little things we do in Wing Chun that I could do a little bit better with a couple little basic ideas that I learned from him. But I didn't like restructure how I do Wing Chun because of it. But I restructured certain things about how I train and how I present certain movements mm. because I had I got a few clues on some things and, and it opened my eyes to other styles of Kung Fu which uh, are, you know, quite practical and quite intelligent. Man. Yeah. Man, what a journey. Yeah. What a journey you've had. Leitin Loy is a total badass. Leitin Loy. Leitin Loy, uh, Sifu Leitin Loy is maybe a little taller. He's around my height, but he's a little skinnier. Mm-hmm. But I have, um, pound for pound, never met anyone who was stronger than he was. Is this the book you showed me? Uh, you came back with a book. I think he's in yeah, that book, yeah. Yeah, it was a um, book, and he was just in. No, no, no. That, that might have been another one. There are a lot yeah. of strong dudes there yeah. that from those styles. Haka uh, styles, you got yeah. a lot of strong dudes in there. But Lee Tin Lo, if you saw him walking down the street, 
you, you Sifu Lee Jin Loy is the oh, most un, the unassuming. No, he's the most unassuming <laughs> person. He's got a very stern look on his face. He's very no nonsense. Very classic, cut from that old mold of mm-hmm. what a Sifu is. Like very no nonsense. Um, cracks a smile only when absolutely necessary. Um, but I never met anyone. And mind you, I've trained with a lot of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys. Pound for pound, I've never met anyone stronger than Lee Tin Loy. When he puts his hands on you and he grips, it's like just it's like crushing an orange. Like and he does it and 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 you see he's not using all of his strength. And you just go, Jesus Christ. <laughs> the yeah. handshake. Yeah, it was funny because he told me like they did this type of training where they, they put their fingers on on a table and they put an egg underneath. <laughs> Right. Oh. And you extend your arms and you have someone stand on your arms. So, of course, you have to basically suspend their weight on your fingers. And if your fingers buckle, you crush the egg. Right. And then he, he, I remember I was having a tan tat with him at, at, uh, at a place right, right next to where Grandmaster Yip Man's home was on Tong Choi Street. Oh, okay. There's a little, um, I might have even taken you there. There's a little um, cha san tang, a little diner where they specialize in tan tat. And it's right, in, about right under his crib, the, yes. McDon- the fake McDonald's. No, no, not a fake McDonald's. No, no. Uh, uh, but uh, they, they have the special tan tat there, which is like really good. So after training, we would go there and we would eat and we I've would talk. There. Yeah, we went there. And he goes like, oh, do you know the demonstration where, you know, we put the fingers there and, and, and uh, there's the egg and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I say, yeah, that's amazing. He goes, not so good. He's like, uh, my Sifu could do it with three fingers. <laughs> and he's like, fingers. yeah. So it's like the new, he's almost like the new generation. Uh, he's like, ah, the new generation is not that good. And hang. he's just like, oh, he's, my he's, God. He was doing it like this. Yeah. His, oh, yeah, come on, and he was kind of like you know, yeah, the new generation. We're not, we're not worthy. And he's like, look at this guy, and he's, he's definitely one of the last of that generation. They will not, Jeez. they will never be kung fu masters of his caliber again. Damn. Lee Tin Loy, all those old school guys. Damn it! That, that's kind of that's the end of it, really, for that generation in Hong Kong. Like mm. that's the last of those guys. Damn it! Damn yeah. it! Damn it! Got to preserve the art, people. Yep. Preserve. All right. Next up, man. All right. We got Axel Stone. Axel Stone. That's a name I give cops when, you know, they're trying to kick me out from skateboarding when I was a kid. What's your name? <laughs> Axel Stone? I used to say it was Axel because it's like close to Alex. It was an easy fake name to remember. Yeah. Or I would tell them I was Brian Dennehy, who's actually an actor. But no one. So because I, I used to skateboard when I was a teenager, right? And you get kicked out all the time. Security guards, they get out of here, right? Sometimes they take your name down or whatever. And I was either like I was either Axel something, uh, or I was Brian Dennehy, who was an actor. Yeah. But the funny thing is, like, no one ever knew who Brian Dennehy was. <laughs> I'm like the dude's an act. Like, no one ever knew. I was always Brian Dennehy or Axel something, right? <laughs> those amazing. are my fake. Those are my fake names. Axel. Skateboard punk. Oh yes, Axel Richter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Axel Stone. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bruce Lee's level of skill at the time of Enter the Dragon? Uh, I I don't know. I, I don't know, because what do we know from Bruce Lee from the time of Enter the Dragon? Uh, it's different from, like, in the earlier period where you have, where he's teaching martial arts, like, in Los Angeles, and you have, like, you have a lot of stories from his students in terms of, like, sparring with him and what he was teaching and what he was doing and all oh, this guy tried this and Bruce did this against that. You have a lot of stories about what Bruce was doing from a martial arts perspective when he was in Los Angeles. And then you have some footage of him training in his backyard. Mind you, uh, according to John Little, a lot of that backyard footage where Bruce is like kicking the bag and doing all that kind of stuff, that was that was when he was getting off the back injury. Because some mm-hmm. people say, oh, some of his kicks didn't really look that clean or whatever. Like, look, <clears throat> if, if I just put a video camera in my backyard and I had a heavy bag out there and I'm just mucking around with my students and you just let the camera roll... You know, every rep I'm doing is not like the cleanest rep. You just kind of mucking around and doing stuff. It's like, you know, you nowadays when you put a video on YouTube or you put a video on Instagram, you just put the highlights yeah. of that stuff, right? And and so you're looking at a lot of just raw footage of him just kind of moving around and working, and it's very informal. But from what I understood, a lot of that was when he was 
coming back from his back injury. So he's working on those kicks and he's trying to get back into moving. And this is like in the same year uh, or, or very close to the time that he's going to go and do Big Boss. So he's like trying to really get back into shape. Uh, but we have stories about, Mar about Bruce's martial exploits and prowess up to that point. Okay. When he comes to Hong Kong, he's essentially shooting movies. So what do we know about Bruce's martial arts stuff in Hong Kong? Well, we only know that he was shooting films. We know about his training schedule a little bit because he talked about training two hours a day. And we know that in the in late 72, he got the Marcy machine. And like, you know, we know some stories of, you know, Bolo coming over and him showing this punch and doing this thing here or whatever. But the problem is that you don't have like footage of Bruce hitting a heavy bag in, in Hong Kong. In, in Hong Kong. Okay. You know, you don't have footage of Bruce doing sparring in the backyard with those guys or whatever. So what can we possibly know about Bruce's martial arts skills? I mean, we can make an assumption that he's getting better. He's training. He's still... Is there he, any footage of him at Cumberland Lane? Cumberland Road? Cumberland Road Lane. <laughs> no, it's not Lane Cumberland Road. Road no. Uh, from what? No, I mean, we have photos. There are lots yeah. of photos. I don't know if there's actual footage. Most Damn. of the footage that was shot at the Cumberland Road home uh, was shot by Raymond Chow after Bruce Lee died around that time of the funeral. He shot all that stuff. So I, I, I don't know. Um, it's whack Arnold's. Yeah, it's kind of whack Arnold's. So, so the problem is, like, I can speculate, but what, um, what am I going by, right? Him doing choreography in Enter the Dragon mm. uh, doesn't speak to his martial you know, his martial development since we last saw him teaching people, all right? Because the f teaching Jeet Kune Do and, you know, teaching his students how to spar and move and stuff, that was not his main concern from end of 71 until at the end of his life. Mm. So he was in a totally different mode. So physically, he was probably stronger. Uh, we can assume, I mean, of course, there's the back injury, there's the drug issues, stuff like that, but we can assume he's... Uh, you know, he's still fit. He's still practicing everything. He's definitely maintained his skill. But what, what, what can we say? We, we, we have nothing to go on. Mm. Right? Man. Ooh, well. All right. Next up, we got the Bobinator. The Bobinator. Wow. Of all the kung fu movies you've seen that has Wing Chun, mm -hmm. which one of them do you feel best showcases the art itself, including its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, well, I'm always partial to Prodigal Son. For me, that is the gold standard of Wing Chun films. And I know the final fight scene with Yun Biu, he, he, he doesn't do the best Wing Chun in the final fight scene. Mm -hmm. And I know that to a certain degree, the first Yip Man movie with Donnie Yen is a lot better in terms of putting what looks more like orthodox Wing Chun into choreography, right? Um, but I still want to say it's Prodigal Son because uh, in basically in Prodigal Son, uh, the, you know, Yun Biu, who, who plays Lerung Chan, who's an actual historical character in Wing Chun, mm -hmm. he learns from two teachers, which is, from what we understand, historically correct. Now, exactly how how and what he learned, you know, Lerung Chan, who's Yip Man Si Gong, Learned from Wong Wa Bo, all right, and he learned from Leung Yi Tai, supposedly, all right. That's one of the eighty stories, all right. Or <laughs> so, and if someone's going, well, actually, he only learned from Wong Wa Bo and Leung Yi Tai, okay, whatever, because you're there, you know, okay. Shut up. So, um, so, so basically, uh, it's, it's because the thing is when you when you listen to all these his, this I love historical your troll impersonations. Well, you know what it is? It's, it's the, the problem is that we we don't really know, mm -hmm. but. Different lineages sometimes have a different. I was spin. there though. I yeah, but different lineages. Dreisen knows. Dreisen knows. Yeah. Different lineages have a different spin on it, and the problem is, most people will tell you the one that's right is the one their sifu told them, but the reason it's right is because their sifu told them. You gotta trust your and, sifu and, though. Yeah, but the thing is, their sifu is a swell guy, so of course they believe everything that their sifu says, and it's and their sifu is not necessarily misleading them or lying to them. Their sifu is just telling them what they know or what they remember or what they think they know. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that because people are very loyal to their lineage or whatever, they're gonna say, "No, you're wrong." Actually, so and so. It's like, well, how do you know that? My sifu told me. How does your sifu know that? All right, right. someone told him. Okay, <laughs> if you have a room with five people. And I tell you something and whisper something into your ear. Oh, you whisper it to the next shit. person. It's a game of telephone, right? <laughs> Man. 
within five people in the same room, mm. I whisper something to you, and by the time that gets to the fourth person, it's not the same thing. That is live time right now in the same room with people who know each other. Yeah. Now, you want to tell me that your 89th hand story, and that's probably being very conservative, mm. about exactly what the history of Wing Chun is, by the time it gets to your lips, all right, is 100% accurate because the last person who told you was your Sifu. STFU, all right? Hard STFU. Hard. Okay, all right? Bro, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to say, you shut the front door. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't want to listen to that. All right. So we're STFU talking about. you is shut the front door. I thought it was shut the French toast. <laughs> Cut the GTF out here. <laughs> <laughs> OMG. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so I'm not going to argue with that stuff because you're arguing mm. with people who also don't know, but they're <laughs> so into it because their seafood told them. Mm. All right, fine. Then you're, she was right. All yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, whatever. So anyway, uh, the Leung Jan character learns from two Sifus, right? From Leung Yitai in the film played by the late, great Lam Cheng Ying and uh, Wong Wabo played by the magnificent uh, Sammo Hung. And so in the movie, you know, he learns the, the standard Wing Chun, the mid-range or let's say close-range Wing Chun from Leung Yitai. But Sammo Hung, being a big guy, he teaches uh, Leung Jan's character two things, all right? One, you also need to be able to... to to fight and deal with stuff at long range, like someone trying to kick you and how to deal with that kind of stuff. And also, you have to not worry about always following the rules, right? Because there's one moment where Leung John kind of ties up, uh, uh, or either either Samo ties up Leung, Leung John, or Leung John ties up Samo's character, uh, Wong Wao Bo, and, and Samo gives him a headbutt. Mm -hmm. And he goes, ah! And he goes, uh, Sivu, is this, is this Wing Chun? And he goes, who cares as long as I win? Yeah. All right. Right. <laughs> and that's such a that's, great line. Right. And, and then so it. so he was working on some of the limitations of what, uh, l you know, Yun Bu's Leung John had learned from his first teacher. So then he's able to synthesize both of them. And so for me, Prodigal Son is the gold standard of Wing Chun films because of the Yip Man movies. Hmm. They, they might have got a little tighter in certain, especially Yip Man one, not so much the other ones. And Yip Man, the final fight a lot more accurate in terms of like the Wing Chun choreography. Um, but those are essentially films about Yip Man, not so much about the style of Wing Chun. So that's why I left them a little out of what the... What about the, the, uh, the Wing Chun movie that we don't know about, that you know about? What do you mean? I don't know. There's got to be one movie that you know of that a lot of people don't know about. It's not that mainstream. Formidable that Lady of Shaolin... Uh, it was a movie of uh, the late 70s or early 80s. Okay. And it tells the story of Yim Wing Chun. But, uh, I mean, a lot of Kung Fu heads know that That's movie. the name of the movie. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Formidable Lady from Shaolin. And it's uh, it's about Yim Wing Chun. Okay. And we'll check that out. And Leung Teng was the choreographer. Oh. So so it has the, the, the Wing Chun is very, you know, Leung Teng-ish, right? <laughs> uh, and, and from the... From the 80s, you said? I It's either late 70s, early 80s. Okay. But it's an old, like, period piece style Kung Fu yeah. movie, right? Um, and yeah, a lot of a lot of people know about that one. Um, interesting. Uh, there's a movie called Descendant of Wing Chun, mm. which is not a great Wing Chun movie. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, originally, the it was going to star William Chang. And uh, what? Yeah. So when you can even find online, you can find some. Some, what? Yeah. So, I mean, William Chang was obviously not an actor, but but fa famous, obviously, for being a student of, of Yip Man. Um, he was hired to be in this film. <laughs> and uh, and the problem was that he got uh, that you can even see they have they I have would some pay to go back into time. Where's Dreisen? Yeah, you give it that. Exactly. So that time machine action. <laughs> get him in there. So you can see some photos of William Chang in um, in costume. And uh, and he, uh, what? he like for the film. But William Chung got fired after one week. <laughs> and uh, th there, there are a few stories about why he got fired. Yeah. Um, why, why? <laughs> uh, one, he wasn't able to do any of the action choreography. Uh, it's and, always coming down to choreography, <clears throat> learning the choreography. Well, you know what it is? And this is a perennial issue. And I think people who, who are 
don't follow this stuff, maybe don't realize because this the, like sometimes I'm on Instagram, people are like who would win in a fight, you know, uh, Jet Li or you know Jackie Chan or something like that, and it's like oh you poor bastard, you think these guys are like <laughs> like fighters, you yeah. know what I mean? Like I mean it's not to oh, say that Dito. it's not to say that Jackie Chan couldn't scrap if he had to. I mean the guy's very physical, but yeah. the problem is like oh you don't know the difference between mm. like movie stuff and real mm. stuff right and the fact that you know a lot of the best guys on in movie choreography are not necessarily like the guys who are there hitting the bag and you know working their you know check left hook and that kind of stuff it's like pe people confuse this stuff all the time because they're not really into it real fighters like people from like a professional fighting background are often god awful in choreography because uh, movie choreography is so different from fighting in the ring or whatever. Because uh, fighting in the ring, it's all about you know creating the most damage or winning on points or whatever the game is. Choreography is about doing something that looks impressive really cool. to the audience. Right. And part of that is selling shots. You know, like what makes someone look really good is how his partner sells the shot. Mm. You know, if I if I fire a punch across your face and the camera's in the right angle and that goes across your face and you sell it with a with a wicked head snap, it makes me look awesome. Yeah. But if I go like this and you have no reaction, it looks like garbage. The same punch it brings me back to Rocky three with Mr. T. I yeah. love that fight. Yeah. Yeah. They absolutely. were selling it. Yeah. Totally. Oh, totally. They were selling it. So, but but you need like you need two to tango. Mm -hmm. And also, you need to know how to control your force. And this is not something that most professional fighters have spent any time doing. And so one story was William Cheng was wholly incapable of doing the choreography. The, the <laughs> choreographer was coming in saying, you got to do this and you got to do that. And he just he was very bad at it. Uh, another story was that because William Cheng has his own take on the history of Wing Chun, that he was trying to get elements of the story rewritten to fit his version of Wing Chun history. And to, and that was kind of butting heads because they're like, yo, we just hired you to be the actor. You're wow. not you're not the writer or whatever, wow. right? Um, but anyway, he was, uh, he was fired after a week and then he was uh, replaced uh, by another actor and then they, 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 finished, they finished the film. But it's, a, it's not a great Wing Chun movie either way. But you can, if you look online, actually find uh, William Chung in costume that they took some <laughs> test shots where he's got like, you know, he's got like the long, the long Q hair. And I think he's yeah. wearing a brown Tong Chong. And, and, uh, but the film was uh, never to be with, oh, with him at least. Yeah. Man. That is a great question, Bob and Ader. Let's uh, move right along. Adolfo Gonzalez. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Fun questions. All right. If Yip Man were alive today, what car do you think he would drive, assuming money is not an issue? Uh, well, that's a weird question because um, having a car in Hong Kong is like having a car in New York. It's way more of a burden than it is uh, than it is a convenience. Didn't he have a car in, in Hong Kong? No, no. Most no. people, most people, especially at that time, you yeah. don't have cars. Only the ultra wealthy would own a car. Maybe Tang Sang would have a car. Yeah. You know what, what I mean? What kind of car did Tang Sang drive? I don't know, but I can't imagine that he wasn't driving a Mercedes white, or something like white that. White car with red interior? <laughs> yeah, red leather interior. <laughs> red right? leather interior. Uh, no, that's a really good question. Man. I'll have to see if I can maybe ask Philip Chan or someone like that, a question like that. Um, no, I'm sure. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, Tang Sang lived, he had, he had a home in Kowloon Tong, which mm -hmm. is where Bruce Lee's home was, that area, yeah. which is a wealthy area. Those right are not next a, door. Those are not apartments. Those are actual freestanding homes, which in Hong Kong, it's like it's like in New York. Most people live in apartment buildings. But like if you have a single house where it's just you, yeah, you got to go New somewhere York, else. Yeah. No, I mean, but like sometimes you go to Queens and like you'll see a single and someone owns that. You go like the dude's doing well for oh, themselves. Sheep's right? Head Bay, Brooklyn. Yeah. Something like that. Right. All the dope houses. Over there. So uh, Tang Sang owned a home in Kowloon Tong and also in Phan Lang. So. I'm pretty sure he probably had a car as well. Two uh, baller cribs. Yeah, two baller cribs. He never gave Yip Man a car? Well, Yip well, Man, Yip Man may not have been able to drive. You know, right. there's these like weird people who don't go for their driver's license until they're like really crusty ass <laughs> old. And, yeah, I, hey. I, I hate those guys. Yeah, hey, because well, you know that they're, hey. they wasted so many years where they could have been getting good at driving. And then it's like trying to teach an old dog new tricks. Is that he, so? Yeah, like some old bastard that goes to driving school when he's like in his 40s what? and then does his license. Like, what? What? like life advice, never get in the car with that guy. Oh yeah, and you know the worst thing about those kind of guys is then they make really bad choices about cars they buy, like right. buying a Lexus mm -hmm. or something like that. You know yeah. what I mean? 
Yeah, that's the problem. You're late in life license, and then you're like, <laughs> what kind of car do I need to get? Let me get a Lexus. All right. The, L- the LILs, yeah. late in life. Yeah, yeah, late yeah. In life. You know what a Lexus in life is-, is called in Japan? Uh, Toyota. It's called a Toyota because <laughs> that's what it is. All right. And Toyotas are great cars. All right. So they should just call it what it is. Call it what a it is. Toyota. All right. I call it as I see it. Yeah. So wow. anyway, what car would you manage? I don't think he would even drive. In you don't this, think so. In Hong Kong. Look, he lived in Tong no. Choi Street. You remember where he was? Between a bus and the train. Where do you, why do you need a car in Hong Kong? You really don't need a car in Hong Kong unless you mm. live maybe in the new territories or something like that. Even today. The public transportation in Hong Kong is so killing. Yeah, it is really killing. It's so dope. killing. You don't it's need really a car dope. that you don't need a car. So you don't think he'll have a car? No, 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 not no. Not even for fun purposes. No, no. It's just not his style. Oh. It's not his style, no. Wow. This is an old school. He's getting cool. driven around. Yeah. That's yeah. more his style. Yeah, maybe. Come yeah. pick me up. You want to hang out with me. Right. You want to go do dim sum, you got to come pick me right. up. Right, right. Wow. Damn. Sorry, Adolfo. I wanted to know the answer to this one. Mm-hmm. All right, another. Uh, this is this is Adolfo. Still, he has like a more of a uh, two three parter. Okay. Uh, do you think that Bruce Lee or David Carradine? Uh, yes, I spelled the name wrong. Too lazy to look it up. Caused the kung fu frenzy in the seventies, eighties, or nineties. Uh, <laughs> Bruce Lee or David Carradine? Who caused the kung fu frenzy? The frenzy. Uh, neither. David uh, Carradine. Neither. All right. The Hands first down, David Carradine caused n- it. Neither. The first Kung Fu movie to come to the States was Five Fingers of Death with Lo Lee. Preceded the Bruce Lee films. That started showing yeah. in the theaters in New York City. Yeah. That was the movie that made people go, what? Oh, yeah? And then very shortly after that, Bruce Lee came. So f- in terms of watching Kung Fu movies. Ooh. No five man. Five fingers, yeah, yeah. No, I five fingers of death. That. Low Lee, Low Lee that. is the OG Low when it comes, to, especially here in New York, right? And then that's what shot it off, right? You have to imagine that like the Kung Fu TV series was just something that ran slightly after that came out, and then Bruce mm. Lee hit, and then who the hell cares about David Carradine? <laughs> Next question. Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners, are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for KFG fans. Right now, you can get an all-access, one-month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to WCINewsstand.com and register in the upper right-hand corner. Fill out your email and password and use the code KFGTRIAL to get your free trial to all the issues from 2011 to the current issue. That's right, all the issues, even the one with this cool guy on the cover. That's me for those of you listening to us on audio. My Kung Fu Genius column is also in all the new issues as if you needed another reason to get this awesome magazine. Go get your free trial subscription today. For all that information, check out the description below. And now back to me. All right, next part. Next part. How do you feel about when people say it Kung Fu or Gong Fu? Oh, the two different spellings? Oh, I'm kind of ambivalent on that. You know, I'm I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to Chinese and Cantonese and the yeah. correct pronunciations and stuff like that. But when it comes to that, um, I I also feel that you need to speak like uh, you need to say certain things the way everyone else says it. Otherwise, you just sound off, sound kind of off, or you sound like a bit of a tryhard. Mm. So, um, not to blame the Brits, but I'm going to blame the Brits. Yeah. Um, so blame it on the bridge. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so yeah. The, the problem is, as I've discussed multiple times on this podcast, there, there's no standard romanization for Cantonese into, you know, our alphabet, the Latin alphabet or whatever. And so, uh, you know, when you see a uh, when you see something like beauty, the mm. second form. OK, so how do you write that in English? OK, or how do you I'm oh, sorry, how do you write that in the Latin alphabet? Right. Well, B I U B E W, uh, you know. I mean, there's like there's B-E-W th- yeah, but always- I mean, like, but but the thing is, either one of those could give you a correct approximation, right? T Z I J I T Z E T Z I. That that's already the problem because there's no standard way of writing. I mean, look at Wing Chun and all of its myriad spellings, right? Yeah. Uh, and the main reason why you didn't see a lot of W I N G C H U N, which is for all intents and purposes, the most commonly accepted spelling is because the acronym WC means toilet. <laughs> okay, so you go to Europe 
And when you see the the toilet, it says WC, so yeah. for water closet, yeah. right? Same in Hong Kong, which was a British colony. They, you still see WC as the toilet there, right? So in Hong Kong, they never wanted to spell Wing Chun, W-I-N-G-C-H-U-N, because the acronym would be WC, which literally means toilet. Is that why Lung Ting changed it up? No. A re- the, the first spelling that they came up with was V-I-N-G-T-S-U-N, mm. when when they had to form the Wing Chun Athletic Association in 1966. In Hong Kong, the, the, the British government, uh, facing some pressure from from certain groups because a lot of martial arts schools had triad connections. And so as a result, they wanted to out these people and out these elements. So what did they do? In around 1966, they made a law that all martial arts schools have to officially register. Because until then, Kung Fu schools, like Yip Man didn't form an LLC or an S Corp in the 50s. You know what I mean? <laughs> what was he doing? He was teaching at the restaurant uni. He was collecting fees and he just collected, pocketed Under that the money. Table, boy. All right. This wasn't like a company. He didn't have like the Wing Chun Limited Company. Mm. At that time, he's just taking money, right? And then he reports whatever he wants to report. Well, by 65, 66, the Hong Kong government changed the law, said if you're a martial arts school, you have to formally register as an association, which means you have to register as a business. Mm. Okay, because what they wanted to do is they wanted to kind of know who's teaching and they wanted to have the ability to kind of have a little transparency, partially because of all the um, triad connections with Chinese martial arts. So that was why in 65, 66, they formed what's known as the Wing Chun Athletic Association. This was actually a requirement because of Hong Kong law, all right? So that was then the first time they had to actually figure out because with the, um, uh, with the Hong Kong government, you know, with them being, with Hong Kong being a British colony, mm-hmm. they had to have a spelling in the Latin alphabet for all the Chinese stuff. So basically that's when they had to decide, okay, boys and girls, how are we actually going to spell Wing Chun? Because until then, the only people who practiced Wing Chun were Chinese. So how you spelt it using the alphabet was irrelevant because it's just the two Chinese characters right. for everyone. Wing Chun, you speak Chinese, you write Wing Chun. Doesn't matter. How do you write that? For, who cares? They're not teaching foreigners. But now that they had to officially register, uh, they had to come up with a spelling. So the WC one was a non-starter. But the word chun, chun, which means springtime, is not ch- chun, the way most like Americans say Wing Chun. It's totally wrong. All right. The CH in Cantonese is a lot sharper. Mm. Ch, ch. It's not cha. Ch, ch. The mouth is uh, more closed. All right. And it's not un, it's un, chun, 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 wing chun, wing chun. All right. It's shorter. And, and, and so that's why the TS, because sometimes when you combine in certain phonetic systems, TS, it makes it that uh, much it's not to sun all right it's t- because you're supposed to combine the t and the s together not say them independently of each other okay so it's ton ton t- 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 see here Damn, the t this whole time i've ton. been calling all right. it winged sun yeah winged everyone's sun. saying wing sun right it's like there was a silent t what well, i love what's the difference between wing chun and wing to sun and i go i don't know <laughs> And I just walk away. All right. <laughs> so, wing to sun. Wing to sun. I don't know. I've never heard of wing to, wing sun, to sun before. Wing all right. To sun. Wing chun. The problem is someone, and it could be Yip. So Yip Man purportedly studied <laughs> English when he went to university at St. Stephen's up. College. But for the life of me, you never really hear any stories about Yip Man actually speaking English. So he might have studied it. And not really been able to speak it, or his English might not have been good. Uh, Siva Leung Ting told me some funny story about Yip Man trying to speak English um, in a, uh, um, saying something on a license plate. But, like, he, he made a mistake, and, like, he tried to be funny, and it wasn't Yo. funny because, like, he couldn't really speak English that well. So, so like, the only one story I have about oh. Yip Man kind of saying something in English was through Leung Ting. He told, told me the story that there was some acronym on a license plate, mm-hmm. and then Yip Man looked at it and wanted to say something funny about it in English, but actually... He what botched he, it. He botched it, right? And they were all kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyway, he's Yip Man. What are you going to wow. say, right? So... um so we don't know if this is Yip Man's mistake mm. or someone who advised him on how to spell wing because wing is pretty obviously W-I-N-G, all right? Wing, right? But someone, whether it was Yip Man or whatever, put the, um, put the thing in his ear that V is the W sound. Mm. So he spelled it V-I-N-G. Now, I've later heard 
that the reason why they use the V-I-N-G spellings, because, well, you know, Cantonese is tonal, and there are all these subtleties about the tone. That, okay, I'm going to tell you, Dre, mm -hmm. is bullshit, okay? Because the, the, big con what? the big controversy about Cantonese tones, there are really only six tones in Cantonese. Some say there's seven. Only six. Only six, yeah, which is already <laughs> a lot, right? Because there's like a, a high level tone and a high falling tone. And to the Cantonese ear, they cannot discern the difference. So most modern Cantonese books do not make a difference between the high tone and the high falling tone. It's the same. So it went from seven to six. Ah. But like the linguistic experts, like the nerds in the universities, say that there are nine tones in Cantonese. But you know why that's bullshit? Because it doesn't matter if they say they're nine tones. It matters what do Cantonese people actually say and do and speak. My wife grew up in Hong Kong, educated in Hong Kong, graduated University of Hong Kong as a lawyer, mm -hmm. very high level. All right? Man. I go, name all the tones to me. Tell me all the nine tones. And she looks at me like I'm a space. <laughs> she can't do that. All right? <laughs> there are only six. Okay? Only six. Okay. So some people clearly seeing that v-i-n-g is totally erroneous it's not wing you you have to know that because if you, anyone looks at that you say ving it's v all right but in cantonese it's wing wing it's a low level tone it's six tone wing it's not mm -hmm. ving there is no v sound in all of cantonese phonetics wow. you have never heard someone in chinese say like whole va, va. you never hear va, va. There's no V in Cantonese. Right. It does not exist. That's funny. All right. There's no V in Cantonese. It just, it, it's just not there. All right. So because people feel embarrassed about this stuff, this, some people created some bullshit explanation about, well, you don't, un you poor dumb Westerners don't understand about all the subtleties of Cantonese and all the tones. And so actually it is correct that it's V-I-N-G. No, it's not. It's bullshit. It's a mistake. And so you have to know that that V-I-N-G, you got to pronounce that wing. All right. You have to know that because that no, by no phonetic standard is that correct. Mm. All right. If anything, V in any alternate phonetics, like in German, sounds more like an F, but not like a W. That's, that's not even a stretch. That's just nonsense. All right. Wow. So that's where, um, that's where that spelling came in. So anyway... I totally forgot how we how and why we got on Kung that. Kung Fu Gong Fu. Ah yes, yeah. there we go. Okay. So in Cantonese, the term of Kung Fu should be pronounced Kung Fu Kung. It's a G. Kung Fu. But the Brits, in their kind of nonsensical way of transliterating stuff, write that as a K. All right? And so the K U N G mm -hmm. is a Britishism from the colonial times in Hong Kong. And it's stupid. But most older generation Hong Kong Chinese, they write anything that starts with a G, they write with a K. So, Siva Leung Ting is my Si Gong. All right? Si Gong. Gong, 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 Gong. G. Every time he's, he wrote an email to me, he wrote Si Gong, K-U-N-G. Because that's old school oh. British. So, so, the K thing is actually a Britishism. All right? And the problem with that, all right, Besides the fact that it's literally a G sound, not a K sound, so it's already inaccurate, mm. is that Cantonese also has the K sound. So the problem is, if you're going... That's not confusing. Yeah, well, well, that's the thing. So if you have like, 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 kong, kong, K-U-N-G, it could mean like poor, all right? But gong, gong. Gong is a G. These are two different sounds. But if you ask a Hong Kong Chinese person to transliterate both of them, they would transliterate both of them as K-U-N-G. Kong and Gong, they would just K-U-N-G. So that's why it's unbelievably inaccurate, okay? Mm -hmm. Because so if Cantonese did not have a K sound and only had a G sound and they decided to use K, but you know it's pronounced like a G, it would be more acceptable. But Cantonese has both, has words that start with K, and words that start with G, mm. and they all write it as a K. So that is a problem. So the thing is that Kung Fu, K-U-N-G, is the most commonly accepted spelling. So I use that one because I feel that when people go Kung Fu, oh, Bruce Lee spelled it G-U-N-G or whatever, it's more phonetically accurate. But honestly, it comes off as being a bit try hard. It's like someone writes like, oh, I practice Kung Fu. And by the way, if you sp see it spelled G-O-N-G, F-U, 
All right. That's the Mandarin pronunciation, which is bong. That's when you yeah. tell them F U. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Right. But the O N G, that is the Mandarin pronunciation. It's not gong in Mandarin, it's gong, right? But in Cantonese, it's gong with a U, right? Mm. And I always find it kind of funny. People are like, I teach gong fu, right? Or jun fan gong fu, or I teach this style of gong fu. And I go, oh, you're a Cantonese ph phoneticist? All right. Uh, ah. Tell, tell me how you say Sifu. Yeah. 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 I want to hear how you pronounce that. Oh, that's unbelievably inaccurate. But on the Kung Fu, you're all like yeah, you, hot and bothered about it. that with the G, right? Yeah. So I'm like, unless you're going to do that with everything, um, calm down, buddy. <laughs> Take it easy. All right. All right. Let's go to the next one. In past episodes, you've mentioned Hong Kun as another style of Kung Fu you dabbled in. Would it be possible to get the Sifu you mentioned to get on the show and ask him questions live? Sorry, I forgot his name, but I know you had a clip of him drinking coffee and hitting the wooden dummy. You know who he's referring to? It must be Maxivu, of course. Right? Okay. Yeah, of course, he was talking about Maxivu. Well, oh, I, 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 actually, I actually did that. Um, if you go to realeast.com r e e l e a s t mm -hmm. which is uh, Bay Logan's site we yeah. actually did a zoom call or a zoom is it a kfg episode no it's not a kfg episode okay. last year we did a a, a combined hongkun and wing chun comparison it, it's up on youtube no it's not up on youtube it's at realeast.com ah and I think you were literally here when we recorded that. Jesus Christ, Dre. Word. I think you were even my partner when I did that. <laughs> my God. Are you lying? I wasn't, no. I wasn't here. You weren't here? No, it might have been Mikey Diesel. Weed, I don't know it about been that. Mikey Diesel. No, it's it definitely not Mikey Diesel. It might have been. So anyway, we did like a, he would or show, uh, I would explain something about Wing Chun and then demonstrate something. He would explain something about Hong Kun and might demonstrate have been Nick. it. And, um, and so we, we actually did that already. You can actually purchase that at mm. realeast.com. Yep. Uh, Maxivu is a very good friend. If he wants to come on the podcast, I'm more than happy to do that. But I wouldn't say that I really dabbled in Hongkun. I mean, I, I, I've picked his brain ad nauseum on things, and, and he's shown me a couple things. But I wouldn't say, like, to say that I've dabbled in Hongkun is a, a bit of a stretch. <laughs> okay. All right. Lastly, what if monks never taught other people Kung Fu? I feel it would be a tremendous loss to us who study and appreciate it now. Yeah, I don't really believe most kung fu comes from monks. I believe some <laughs> some of it did. Some, some monks of it did. Some monks knew kung fu and taught laymen, but this trope that kung fu comes from it's just a trope from monks. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. <laughs> Get out of here with that nonsense. All right, next one. All right. Look, Chinese martial arts predate the Shaolin Temple. Yeah. All right. That's already the mic drop on this thing that all martial arts come from Shaolin. You can find in archaeological records weapons that are that are attributed as Shaolin weapons that predate Buddhism. Not not even just the Shaolin Temple, but Buddhism itself. China is such a big country. All right. That has a huge border that borders all sorts of different countries. All right. And so they have constantly had to defend their borders against invaders. So fighting on horseback with weapons and one-to-one, -one, these are things that they've been doing since the beginning of time. You have to imagine that something like this has to be true for the Shaolin Temple story to be real. For, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, mm. all right? China's being invaded by all these foreigners, mm. but they don't know. Especially the Brits. Yeah, but they don't know how to do anything. All right, mm. they don't know how to fight. They go, oh, I don't know. I guess they're gonna come in. I don't know. We don't know anything. We're gonna fight. <laughs> oh, and no. then finally, Buddhism is developed, which is this peaceful martial art. And a Buddhist monk named Damo <laughs> goes to China. Oh no! All right, and teaches yeah. these Shaolin monks who are starting to learn Buddhism, how to breathe better because they're falling asleep during meditation. And through these breathing techniques... This is the law. And through these breathing techniques, peaceful Buddhist monks developed fighting. And for the first time in the long history of China, peaceful Buddhist monks were the ones that introduced, oh, you know what? You can stab an mf -er with a sword. I never knew you could do that. You know what else? You, you can take your fist and ram it in someone's face. Oh, 
Thank you, Buddha. <laughs> Until this moment in history, we had no idea that we could actually use physical violence against someone else. Yo. You have to believe some version of that in order to think that Chinese martial arts came from the Shaolin Temple. Nonsense. Next question. I love it. All right. <laughs> Next up, we got Alan Horton, AIA. That's what's up. I've heard of that guy. <laughs> I know that guy. You yeah. know that guy? Yeah. yeah. All right. Question. Do you believe there's a relationship between Bruce Lee's drug use and pain associated with his back injury? Which must have been, which must have made his goals seem impossible to achieve at times. That's good. I mean, for sure. Um, but of course, when you talk about drug use, what drugs are we talking about? Because, you know, Bruce was taking pretty heavy pain medication. Uh, he had had those, uh, he had injections, you know, the, the cortisone injections, which is not really... Which is, is not like a drug thing, but but it it you know it's it's to alleviate the the inflammation and all that kind of stuff. And of course, Tom Bleeker, uh, in his famous book, totally confused corticosteroids with anabolic steroids in the funniest way, where you go like, oh my god! Like you ever notice someone is arguing something with you and they're totally wrong to begin with, but they keep arguing. Oh yeah. And you just like at some point you're not invested anymore, and you just want to say, in your best ASMR style voice. <laughs> Corticosteroids are not anabolic steroids. It's not the same thing. Genius. You can keep talking, but that will not change that fact. So you just kind of go like, stop, stop. Yeah. All right. And obviously, Bruce had to take a lot of pain meds to get over that back injury and stuff like that. So for sure, um, you know, a certain amount of his drug use was to alleviate this very painful back injury, right? But it's, I think, a bit of a stretch to think that he got into cocaine because of his back pain. Yeah, so no. some people have said that and it's like, well, okay, like, look, I'm not a drug genius. All right. Mm. Um, Bruce himself in the letters say that he told Bob Baker, it's like, I need the cocaine because it's, it's helping me write this character. Yeah. So he's using it for creative purposes. And I don't really think that being high on cocaine is going like, oh, my back feels amazing on this. I don't think that is the intended effect or use of cocaine right mm. so uh it, it, it really doesn't make sense but but you know if you talk about things being like gateway drugs you know are the pain meds kind of the gateway to getting into harder stuff i don't know maybe all right but for sure after 1971 bruce was taking some some pretty regular you know bruce's drug use had definitely shifted gears after 1971 all right. So, yeah. All right, man. Next question. All right. So next up, we got Dreisen. And Dry what? What? I don't get it. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. What All do you right. Mean? Let's see. You don't get it. Huh? I don't get how he this has... guy gets in every episode. He's not in every episode. First of all, yes, he is. Secondly, he doesn't ever seem to be in any of the comments. That's right. He's in all the comments. I see him all the time. Okay, here's what I want you to do. When send I'm me, riding the train back to Jersey, I see his comments. Send me screenshots. Does he delete them after he writes them? What's I don't going know. on? That guy is... He's a phantom. He's a phantom. Yeah, he doesn't uh, exist, or rather, he does, yeah. Dre. All right. Let's go. Let's go. Um. So Dreisen is asking a hypothetical. Shocker. So... He's asking, so one day, you're teaching the bomb class, bomb class up on the fifth floor, and it's about a good, a good 20, 25 of us, boom, 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 bam, you know, boom, breaking, breaking bones and shit. Is this even shit. something written down somewhere yeah, on right this here. green earth? It's breaking, we, we up there rattling. Yes. Rattling shit. You know, I can see now because you, you know, got sunglasses on. I can see what's on that screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's blank. It's literally it's right literally here. It's literally blank. It's right here. All right, let's go. Let's go. And uh, all of a sudden, the bell rings. Boo, the buzzer. Boo. Yes. And then, you know, it buzzes again. Boo. And then like you like, yo, open. Someone buzz that person in. And then 
Of course, I'm I'm like right there by the door usually. I buzz them in. You got your impression of Seagum, by the way. Yeah, yeah, oh, that that was legit. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I've been practicing that Amazing. shit. Wow, wow. So, a few maybe seconds later, dude busts in, and he's looking all confused, like, and and you're looking at him, and you're all confused, like, yo, and everyone turns by the way, they this, see your face. By the way, this situation happens pretty regularly at City Ring Chuck. <laughs> The number of people who come up to the fourth floor and then they go. Well, he busts into a, the fifth floor. Uh, is this a tattoo shop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he made it past the fourth floor somehow. Uh-huh. Be- and he's up on the fifth floor. And you, everyone sees your face. Uh huh. And then they look at the door. They're like, oh. And then they, you know, you, you're like, How, can I help you? And he's like, I'm here. I'm here for Yip Man's class, but this I've is actually, obviously not Yip Man's I've, class. I've actually had someone say that before, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually had someone come in here and ask me if Yip Man teaches here. Wow. Uh, and the, the person was dead serious. And I was like, Yip Man died in 1972. And he was like, no, I just saw him in a movie. You're lying. No. And this I just, I just looked at the guy and I was like, no, this is some New York shit, man. <laughs> I this mean, what did not happen? This did happen. Wow. Ask, ask your Simo. Yo. Yeah. Anyway, you realize this, it's a young Bruce. Uh huh. And he just literally went through a time vortex. Didn't even understand what happened. He came up here through a time vortex. But you figured it out before he did. Obviously. Yes. Yeah. Because you've been through so many of these yeah. time vortexes. Clearly. It's a normal thing. Yeah, exactly. And language. I'm sorry. What? Our poor editor Andrew. He has to, he has to constantly <laughs> he keep his finger on the buzzer got, with, with you. Did, did Dryson so, put the F word into the comments? Yes. You're clearly right again, you. again, he has not even looked down once while he's saying this question. And it's by right. the way, the setups of the questions now take so long. Get to the, the point. Question. The question is, do you take him on as a new student? Because he can't go back. There's no way for him to go He's back. He's here now. He's here now. Yes. Young Bruce. Right. And you you know what's happening to him. You know yes. he's in a time vortex. You yes. know that he has to continue his, his studies. Right. So do you take him as the new student of City Wing Chun? Yes, of course. And be like, yo, this is what's happening to you. Yes. You're this guy. Right. This is you. Yes. You have to continue to learn here now. Right, right. Because your ass ain't going back to sure. the 50s. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I would teach him Wing Chun. Yeah. I would introduce would you him to... Fin- would you long I, I pole would, him? And, I, I would teach him... Would you the, long pole him and, and, uh, and sword him? Whoa, take it easy. Take <laughs> it easy. Bajam <laughs> ba- ba- do him? <laughs> what does it mean to long pole him? I don't understand that, all right? This is not a normal thing we say in the Wing Chun bro. Would you long pole him? I don't know about that. Would you that. teach him the long pole him? Uh, Bajam do him. I would, te- he, I would, teach, him, I would teach him the whole system. It. Okay. And uh, introduce him to boxing, introduce him to oh, fencing, okay. introduce him to some jujitsu. Yeah. Uh, show him lots of fights. Oh, and, man. you know, kind of round out his education because he's already got the brain for these kind mm-hmm. of things, right? Give him a jump start on the things that maybe would have taken him a few years to figure out. Just give him all, pack all that information yeah. in there, train him, give him everything, right? And then once he knows all this martial arts stuff, okay? He become his agent. Uh, no, I would put him in serious drug education at that point. <laughs> All right. Oh, 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 oh. What was the back this, in the day? No, no. Care or oh, dare? This dare. D a r e drug. Yeah. Something. This is your brain. <laughs> this is your brain on drugs. You show him the skillet and everything. And the skillet yeah. and the egg. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> and then I would be like, "Look, all mm. right. Let's see what happens to people mm. who regularly abuse cocaine." All right, they want to eat and products. he'll be like, and he and he's like very young, right? And he's like, why, why do I always say this? Like no, 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 eighteen, right? Yeah, it's like no, 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 no. You're like, why, why are you showing me this stuff? You, you, you know, you're always showing me martial arts stuff. No, 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 no. I just need to show you this. Yeah. All right. I just yeah. need to show you this. Yeah. All right. Yes. So there you go. Man. And if you really still don't believe me, here's Mikey Dean. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. If you don't believe me, <laughs> listen to my sound, dude. He knows. Yeah. He knows a thing or two. <laughs> About the cokes. You don't want to get like him. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that's how you. There you go. Get him. All right. All right. 
Thank you, uh, Dryzen, wow, for, for that question. Wow, we that one pretty quickly. Well done. You're yeah, right. normally he doesn't let me off the hook with us. He doesn't even want to finish the episode until I give him some bullshit answer. <laughs> uh-huh. No, I was, I, But today I, he was satisfied with my bullshit answer to the bullshit Dry, uh, question. Dryzen was satisfied, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you, next you, up. You got a psychic connection to him, right? <laughs> no. You guys have like Vic, uh, Vulcan mind melded <laughs> together, right? Now, if you actually read what's on his screen, it says, all work and no play makes Dryzen a very dull boy. <laughs> Ooh, shining reference. Damn. All right, let's go. Damn, Dryzen. All right, Michael Flynn. Okay. Hi. Hi. Do you find that muscular guys like myself have a hard time learning WT? And do women pick up the concepts of WT faster than guys? Thank you. Mm, That's a great question. Uh, It's always impossible to say, you know, all people in this group are blah, 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 Mm. and all people in this group are blah, blah, blah. Normally, when uh, people say, like, you know, all muscle-bound people cannot learn Wing Chun, usually usually two things are occurring, all right? Either they are just telling you what their teacher told them, all right? It's a common trope, not just in traditional martial arts, but also in boxing. In fact, this morning, I was just uh, watching, uh, you know, Teddy Atlas, um, and his oh, podcast, right? Okay. And he was talking about the Deontay Wilder Tyson yeah. Fury fight, and talking about how um, <laughs> how, how uh, Wilder was too too muscle bound for this fight, and you know there's there's the constant debate, and he was talking about how the old boxing masters uh, basically you know were all against weightlifting mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff, and he says they were right for the most part because obviously if you're too muscle bound you know, you have to provide oxygen to all those extra muscles. So, you know, in the context of boxing, it can make you slower. Mm -hmm. He said uh, Deontay Wilder was like someone who was wearing a suit that was two sizes too small for him because he just has all Mm. this extra weight and you get tired. And and so your conditioning is going to be taxed a lot more when you have this extra, you know, extra muscle mass. Now, of course, that's a little bit different than whether you can get good at Wing Chun or not because we're not talking about fighting in a you know multiple rounds in boxing we're talking about a traditional martial arts so the requirements are like a little bit different but even it, the whole thing about not lifting weights and not being too muscle bound is not solely something you hear about in traditional martial arts but even in boxing and then but Teddy Atlas actually said but actually they were they were kind of both wrong and right he goes because there's a way you can lift weights mm-hmm. um, an intelligent way where you can improve strength and your movement abilities and your uh, mobility and everything like that without becoming too muscle bound. And I think that's usually the problem when people talk about whether you should. Now, I know he's talking about like muscle, like whether you someone is like muscle bound or whatever. And, and here I'm talking a little bit about more about the methods. People conflate strength training and bodybuilding. OK, mm-hmm. these, these are two different things. You can lift weights in both of them, but it's about the aims. In bodybuilding, the aim is aesthetics. You want to have a well-balanced and well-proportioned physique in that kind of classic sense. You know, the for, you know, for men, you know, you have the big pecs and the big round delts and the shoulders and the triceps and the biceps and the legs and everything like that. Like myself, yes, exactly like you. You are you are the gold standard of of bodybuilding, what, what, of bodybuilding right? right? Exactly. In the road. <laughs> the rogue <laughs> so gold so so basically you, when in the old days you know when people like Sifu Lang Teng would say you shouldn't lift weights or you know old boxer trainers would say that oftentimes it's you shouldn't do bodybuilding mm-hmm. okay because the problem is you're 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 building a lot of this muscle mass which is for aesthetics which can be um antithetical to your aims in martial arts, right? One, you now carry all this extra mass on you, which has to get oxygen through, you know, through your cardiovascular system, right? So now you got to do a lot more work to be able to perform as long as someone who doesn't have as much of that muscle mass, right? So, but there is a huge glaring, like these are two completely different worlds, the world of bodybuilding Mm -hmm. and the world of strength training. All right. Strength training is usually literally what it says is about becoming stronger. And you can use weights, you can use body weight, you can use bands, you can do explosive stuff. That's a much broader type thing. And even if you lift weights, the difference between strength training and let's say bodybuilding is in strength training in general, you tend to do more compound things where you're using multiple muscle groups in one lift where your whole, your legs, your upper body, your arms, everything to perform it. So you're using the body as a, as a complete organism rather than separating it. Whereas in uh, bodybuilding, you might just do bicep curls. Just to isolation. Make, yeah. You have some isolation, right? Although good bodybuilders, 
usually mix compound movements and isolated movements, right? But their number one concern is not how mobile are they, how well do they move, and how good is their cardio. Their concern is how big are their arms, how, you know, compared to how big is their upper body compared to their waist, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, like their chest size, these kind of proportions, right? Yeah, it's so, tough for me. So I think that, uh, yeah, it must be tough for you. Yeah, yeah. So I think the difficult the part is for people to realize, hey, all right, bodybuilding is not the same as strength training or, or, or power lifting, for example, right? So uh, to say that every single person who does bodybuilding has no chance to learn Wing Chun, I think is usually either said by people who, well, Sifu said, if you're a bodybuilder, you can't learn Wing Chun. Or quite honestly, what's often the case in the terms of Wing Chun is a lot of the Wing Chun instructors, they don't have a lot of students. So the problem is you have sampling bias. If you've taught for 10 years, but in those 10 years, you've only taught 40 people over the course, you have a very small sample. Okay. And if you had one bodybuilder in there that was uh, not very mobile, didn't move very well, well, there you go. Yeah, bodybuilders can't learn Wing Chun, all right? But we here at City Wing Chun have a student who's a bodybuilder. Oh, yeah. And uh, Mr. He, Universe, he, he, former Mr. He's, Universe. He's, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't know what, what level he competed at, but he's very, very high level, all right? And, you know, he's older now. He's not actively competing, but he did compete for many, many years. And he still actively bodybuilds. I mean, the dude is shorter than me and outweighs me by, you know, 40 pounds, right? right? right. He's just jacked. So he's an older bodybuilder. So he has the additional disadvantage of he's got all the injuries from years of bodybuilding. Yeah. And he has the classic issues that a lot of bodybuilders have. Obviously, it's harder for him to move his elbows in because of he's got massive chesticles. Like myself. And, and yes, and you know the big delts and everything like that. But what did we teach him to do? We teach him how to overcome those limitations by adapting his Wing Chun to his body type. And I feel that a lot of Wing Chun instructors are like, oh, if your muscles are too big, you can't bring your elbows in and you can't do good Wing Chun. Well, that's a great cop out to not figure out a way to make Wing Chun work for someone who's got a different body type. As if everyone in the world has the body type of Grandmaster Yip Man, five foot two and you know ninety five pounds, soaking wet. You know what I mean? Like myself. Like you also, right? Uh, so, so, so you know, so, so there's the issue, right? So I mean, of course, if you had one or two bodybuilders, because before, uh, you know, before Tom, I taught a number of bodybuilders, and they were all pretty terrible. All mm -hmm. right. They uh, had a very difficult time moving. They had very limited flexibility. All right. Tom has an amazing vertical jump. I don't know if you ever see, see seen him do a what? vertical jump. He can just he can do a front tuck roll into an explosive jump. And he's got higher vertical than me. All right. It's crazy. All right. And I can wow. jump very high. It's incredible. What? Yeah. And you look at that and you go, what? <laughs> right. Really wow. incredible. Really incredible. And he's got a lot more mass. Right. And he's very athletic because he also emphasized athletics at the time he was doing bodybuilding. Mm. Some bodybuilders, they even can do backflips. Generally, those are bodybuilders who also do compound stuff and pull-ups and lots of, you know. You see them in Times Square. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the problem is you cannot say every single person who's muscle-bound cannot be good at Wing Chun. All right? You could say there are certain limitations that often come along with that body type. But a good Wing Chun instructor can teach someone to get around those limitations. For example, the elbow in issue. You know who else has an elbow in issue? W women with, with big chests. Okay. Okay. So what are you going to say? A woman wants to come to you and learn self-defense and is built a certain way. And you build, you can't bring your elbows in. I can't teach you Wing Chun. What kind of nonsense is that? Total. All right. No, you have to make adaptations based on the person's body type. Right. And if you can't do that as an instructor, I don't think you really understand Wing Chun that well. Because then you're just saying like, no, if you're not gifted with a certain narrow sliver of genetics and a body type, I can't teach you. Well, like that's crap. OK, mm -hmm. anybody can swim. Maybe they cannot be like Michael Phelps, but people can still swim even if they have a different body type. Right. So uh, I stay away from these all X body type cannot or can do Wing Chun. Right. In general, women, uh, I find, pick up Wing Chun a lot more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, for a number of different reasons. And again, you cannot say all women this or all women that, just like you cannot say all men this, all men that. But I, I find that oftentimes it's easier to teach women for one very simple reason, okay? In Wing Chun, one of the big things we have to understand is you're most likely yeah, abandoning your force. own force because more than likely your opponent is going to be stronger than you. 
right? So the first step is to abandon your own force to learn how to do movements without antagonistic muscle tension. Because if you're fighting your own movements, you're doing a punch, but your shoulder's up, your chest is unnecessarily tense, you're tensing all these extra things. Well, now in in a in an art of war kind of way, you're fighting a war on two fronts. You're fighting yourself and the person who's in front of you because you're fighting your own antagonistic muscle strength. So the first lesson is to stop fighting with yourself, both mentally, all right, mm -hmm. there's a mental aspect to that, and a physical aspect to that, and these are carried out through the learning of the first form in Wing Chun. And so then after that, you have to learn how to then now, now that you've learned to deal with your own force, which is to not be controlled by it, now you have to learn to deal with your opponent's force, and you have to learn to unload your opponent's force or borrow it. These are the two, two main ideas that we learn in Qi Sao and Inspiring. And so my experience is that if you tell a female student, imagine your opponent is bigger and stronger than you. She has a much easier time imagining that. Yeah. You tell a dude, imagine your opponent is bigger, strong, and bigger and stronger than you. Oh, no. And the dude can say, you know, especially if a guy, if a guy is smaller, of a smaller stature, they under every dude. I don't care how big or strong you are. You could be a big, strong, jack dude. You understand that there are people out there bigger and stronger than you. And if you're a smaller person, you definitely understand that. But to a certain degree, mm -hmm. the male ego, it, it's just... we, we get it cognitively, but we're also like, yo, frick that, man. The dude tries to bump, I'm going to, yeah, you want to yeah. push me, I'm going to push you back. Yeah. Because we have this intense, immediate, mm, visceral reaction when someone pushes us to push back and to use force and to escalate force. Damn. Because it's kind of the way men are built, all right? In my experience, of mm -hmm. course, all right? So it takes a little bit longer to get a dude to come to terms with their ego. There are people bigger and stronger than you, and you always have a problem with the strong dudes in class. Because oftentimes the strongest dude in the class is able to manhandle everyone else. Great. Your Wing Chun is good only in as far as your opponent is equal to or less than your strength. Yeah, like the Enrico's Yes, of life. and like if you are using brute power against all of your training partners in class, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to tell you something that you're not going to be happy to hear. You're going to get attacked by someone who's bigger and stronger and heavier than you. 100%. So you practice manhandling people who are smaller than you You are not at all learning the skill of unloading and borrowing power. And you always come with the assumption that you can just hold your arm really stiff or use brute power and stop the other person. What happens when you don't have that as an option? So that's why even the bigger, stronger students in class, I advise them, even if you are physically stronger than your partner, which you more than likely are, pretend you're not. Because even if you are physically, like, like if I'm physically stronger than you and you give me a punch and I could stop your punch just by holding my forearm with brute strength. Mm -hmm. Okay, I stopped it. Oh, I stopped you, all right? But the person on the street who has no respect for me or who I am or whatever is going to come full power and try to smash my face, maybe I can't stop them. Mm -hmm. But let's say I could. But if I unload their power and move out of the way, I take that same heavy force, let it miss me, and then I can go in and punch them. So what do I get by being imagining my opponent is bigger and stronger? Even when I am stronger than my opponent, I still have nothing but advantage. Mm. Men take a long time to figure this out. They get it here, and finally they're like, oh, maybe I should relax. All right? Two years in. <laughs> Four years later, oh, I can use a lot of brute strength, but if I just turn and give way, even the guy who's weaker than me falls forward and I'm in a better position. <laughs> like I told you the second week you joined. Yeah. Oh, Okay. A woman, you tell them, imagine your opponent is bigger and stronger than you. You want to move out of the way. They go, got it. They got it. Now they just have to learn how to apply the techniques and principles to be able to apply it. But the men need like four years for their ego to be like, okay, there are people who are stronger than me. Wow. I guess I'll concede that. And that for me is the main difference. Mm -hmm. Independent of body type. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. And as always, if you have questions, things you want me to answer on a future episode, go ahead and write them in the comments below. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius and hit that bell for notifications. And I'll see you guys next time.
Word is I'm a kung fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilled. Alex Richter, always the victor. All right. Well, carry on. Jesus Christ. Getting eating his crisps over there. Let's yeah. get to it. All right, that sounds good. Jesus Christ. It made me shit my pants. Let's get to it. What the hell just happened? What happened? What happened? It's the no, that, it's that, the was, that was legitimately one take, and it was great. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, like, nailed it. Like, it was I, a I shade. The apocalypse is nigh. <laughs> <laughs> no, All right, no. let's kill it. Oh. 